when we're faced, beloved, with troubles, with uh, questions, with the need for guidance, we all readily understand that the Psalms are a place to which we go to. Uh, the, the Psalms are words that we not only sing in our praise, but with which we plead in our praying before the face of God. On Wednesday past, to the few that were here in the prayer meeting, I brought the words of Psalm 138 in verse 8 before them. The words which read, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Uh, this morning, my, mindful of what I've mentioned already in my response to the call, I'm convinced that once again, that we need to go to the Psalms and glean the truth of Scripture and uh, know a word in season to our hearts. It is a word that we always seek every Lord's Day. And I can say, truly, as I have stood here, um, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, uh, and I, I hope I can say the same for you as well, that the God has given us a word in season. There have been times, haven't we, where we've, we've come together and the, the, the message has been the very word that we have needed. It has lifted us, it has enabled us, it has strengthened us. And I have no doubt that the message that is before our eyes and our hearts will do that very same thing this morning. We've come to the words of Psalm 125, and we fix our minds upon this opening statement, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. And with those words and the following two verses, we come to think about three things which cannot be moved. Now, ordinarily, the, the term mount or mountain, what does it do? You think of the young ones we hear here this morning. If I say to you, mountain, I think probably more often than not, you're going to think of Everest. You're going to think of the Himalayan range. You're going to think of one of the great peaks in, in the, the geographical landscape in this world. Something which is immense and something which is majestic and uh, a sight to behold in many respects. There, there really are very few things on the face of this earth uh, that seem to be more imposing and almost to some extent more intimidating than a sight of a mountain. Uh, one of those things which we, we say are impossible to move and to budge by human strength and by human endeavor. In, in fact, the idea of someone attempting to move a mountain by their own force is, is comical, isn't it? It's ludicrous. Can you imagine standing by the base of a mountain and pushing and thinking that with your strength and with your willpower, you're going to budge this mountain one inch or one millimeter? Or one degree. It's interesting, however, that when you read the Bible, uh, that even the Lord Jesus Christ takes up the, the impossibility of moving mountains as a way of contrasting vital lessons in the Christian life. It's in Mark chapter 11. Uh, the Lord Jesus spoke about the need for unwavering faith, which is what we all need in these days. Unwavering faith. And what does the Savior do? He, he uses the, the mountains as an illustration, not just simply the moving of the mountain, but the casting of a mountain into the sea. Now, the idea behind the Savior's words there, and we all recognize this, is not that he's advocated that we go out and try to shift these monstrous sites into the nearest ocean, but rather as a way of illustrating that when we have matters which are before us that are seemingly impossible to overcome, that we bring these matters to God alone in prayer. Uh, the words of, of Wesley's famous hymn, rightly cries, give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. And when you understand the meaning of those words in a right setting, by the way, in the right context, this is not you know, a, a permission to sort of ask for the ridiculous or the absurd. Everything is in conformity to God's holy will. But, but the, the emphasis is this, that it is our God who creates these things, who moves these things. Nothing is too big for him. Nothing shall be impossible to God in that respect. However, as we think of our text of Scripture, I want you to understand that you're to think of a very different type of mount when you think of Mount Zion, as to what we've been considering in the introduction. Uh, Mount Zion, while it would have been a raised point to an elevated hill, was not a mountain among the Himalayas. So you've got to really get that in your mind to get the illustration and the point of the, the passage of Scripture here. We know that for a number of reasons. I think the most simple reason is that the area was inhabited. 
and the, the city of Zion, after which it was named after the mountain, became to be built upon that very mount itself and all of the extending region to this present day. So what we find is that when the scripture references Mount Zion, it's not because it wants you to think of an Everest or a Himalayan range, but it wants you to focus upon a, an elevated point, a raised point, a lofty point, yes indeed, but that which upon a city was built, a fixed, immovable base in a sense. That's the idea of this illustration of Mount Zion, which is before us here. In fact, it goes all, all the way back to the beginning, whether it was a simple location, you read in Samuel, where David takes hold of this stronghold, and then the city of Zion in Jerusalem is built as a result. And as time goes by and you look at Scripture, the term Zion, it broadens in its application, and it goes on to reference not only just a location and a place and the base, but it references temple worship. Indeed, it goes on to speak of the whole assembly of the saints of God the church of Jesus Christ. That's the significance of the word and the tense and the, and the, the description that we have here in our scriptures. In other words, it was always before the people. And so whenever any, any reference was made to Zion or Mount Zion, the people understood exactly what was being said. In the course of these verses, in this song of degrees, we have three things which cannot move. First of all, beloved, God's people cannot be moved. God's people cannot be moved. And I know and instantly we're going to say, ah, but we are. And, and, and I'll deal with that very shortly. But understand this principle that is being established in verse 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. What a wonderful statement. But what a deeply searching statement. Because immediately we ask the question, but How? How do I understand the people of God and the church of Christ to be a people who do not or cannot be moved when we live in the midst of a world where the professing church is incredibly moved and, and, and here and there and, and, and falling and departing away from the Lord? How do you understand all of these things? Well, before we analyze the application, uh, keep in mind the picture again which is being painted. As I said, Mount Zion was well known. If you said to someone, well, where's Zion? Where's Mount Zion? No one would scratch their head and go, you know what? I don't know where it is. They, they, all, they all knew where it was. They could all point to the elevated place. They could see where the city was built, the, 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 the suburbs descending down into the present day, which would be very different back to the day of the Psalms, but, but everyone knows. It was the mountain, as I said, which David fortified and upon which the city was built. And as I said, the idea of being built upon this hill or this mount with the mind of the psalmist here is that many things may happen, but one thing remains true. The walls of Jerusalem, well, they may be broken down. Buildings of Zion may come crumbling down. People may be scattered. But this remains the same. It's a, it's a foundation that cannot be moved. And, and what is being emphasized here is, yes, God's people will be a persevering people. That is, those who are truly his. They will be a persevering people. Because as I've indicated, the first thing that comes to mind is this question, but look, I don't feel immovable. And I, actually, at times, as a Christian, I feel very changeable because I look at my love for Christ, and it's not what it should be. And I look at my prayer life, and it certainly isn't what it should be. And I, look, I can look back at times I've backslidden and I've strayed. So how can I be viewed as being immovable? That's why we need to search the Scriptures well, child of God, and also be careful in our application. Remember that it's a simile which is before us. I think most of the young ones have been studying or have studies, metaphors and similes and know exactly what I mean by that word. But notice the language of verse 1. They shall be as Mount Zion. Remember, the thought is this. It's Mount Zion as, as, a, as a base point, as that mount. That cannot be removed in a human sense. That abides forever. And so there is a quality. This is the point here. There is a quality which is true of Mount Zion that is true of the children of God. And it's this idea of preservation and perseverance. 
That's the thought which is here. It's not this thought that there'll be no attack and there'll be no siege and there'll be no trouble because, well, Mount Zion had many of those. The city of David had many of these incidents. But it's the abiding forever. It's the preservation which is in view. It's what we call the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. It's, it's a doctrine, by the way, which is often criticized, wrongly so. Many will criticize it, even uh, those who, who, who profess the Lord, and they, and they say, oh, it, it breeds carelessness in the Christian. If you, if you say that you're preserved to the end and you can never lose your salvation, why, well, you can just live how you want to live. And you can just sin without regard because, well, you've got a license to heaven and none can take that from you. Well, the moment someone says that, first of all, you know they don't understand what they're talking about. They've got no idea of what is meant by the perseverance or the preservation of the saints. Nothing could be further from the truth because the new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ, all things are of God. They have been, they have been chosen in Christ. They have been foreordained unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. The child of God is one that is, is saved to live unto God and will persevere to that very end. An empty faith without living works and fruit is fit for nothing but fire and is to be rejected. As we know, God's preservation of his own by grace, it will always go hand in hand with a holy life and a going on with God, not without the difficulties along the way, but with this eventual final perseverance and preservation. I've often referred to Jude in these matters, and I'll do that again uh, this afternoon. Verse 21 in Jude urges the, ch the, the Christian to keep themselves in the love of God. But verse 24, three verses later on, a few breaths later on, says that we are kept by God. It's amazing, isn't it? Keep yourselves in the love of God. And then the promise is you're kept by God. And it's not a question of which one's right and which one's wrong. It's a matter of they're both right. And they belong together. And they go together. You're kept by God. And being kept by God forever, you'll hold on and you'll love him and serve him. And you'll be like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed. But here's the key. They that trust in the Lord. That's the vital part. That's the critical thing here. And that's the meaning of verse 1. They that trust in the Lord. It's not that our trust creates our security, but it's the trust that evidences our security in Christ. They that trust. That's the character of the one that will persevere. Some won't. Some say they're Christian. Some begin, they think in a Christian manner. Some may have all of the, all of the, the trappings and the outward fringes of Christianity. But where are they now? We don't see them. Were they ever the Lord's in the first place? Who knows? But here is a quality that endures the end. They that trust in the Lord. My call to you, dearly beloved, as I speak to you in light of all that will be ahead of us, is that while there'll be changes and upheavals and strains, yet I remind you of one thing. Your faith is not built on me, but it is on Christ. And that's how this church perseveres. And that's how it goes on. They that trust in the Lord shall not be removed. Secondly, not just God's people cannot be moved, but God's presence cannot be moved. God's presence. Look at verse 2 of our scripture. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. Now the psalmist does go more to a, a, a we might say, a significant mountain range. It's away from Mount Zion and the surrounding mountainous regions which would be there in that territory, and it's like a double layer. Not just Mount Zion, but now think of the mountain range. Now think of those other higher lofty peaks, the protection they offer and provide along the way. That's now in view. And to fuel our fire of trust and faith, we're brought to consider this great illustration. The mountains that surrounded Jerusalem were noticeable. Uh, as I said, they, they were seen in a physical capacity to offer some type of perfect protection and fortification. I think even Zion carries with it meaning of being fortified to some extent. And so the application is this. So the Lord is round about. He's round about his people. And we say, well, Lord, how long for? And he says, forever. 
forever. What a wonderful picture we have here. Not only is the church described as being established and built on the immovable mount, which is Christ, that we all will be moved even if everything else around it does. But now there is the preservation and the presence of God round about his people. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't often feel like this at times or, or acknowledge this, do we? We feel frail, we feel weak, but we ought not to. The presence of the Lord is round about you has always been, shall always be, as not just a means to comfort, to protect and strengthen you. It was Martin Luther who said this, I quote him, it is easier to learn than believe that God's people are surrounded by divine aid. If we were surrounded by visible walls of steel and fire, we would feel secure and defy the devil. What the word reveals, that is the substance of our faith. Isn't it right what Luther was saying? Sometimes easy if we could see things with our eyes, but that's not the case in the Christian life. We're not walking by sight, we're walking by faith. But it doesn't make the truth any less real. We to God that we grasp that and understand it. The Lord round about his people. Thou God seest me. Lord aware and acquainted with all of our ways. What is it the Lord says in Psalm 46 verse 7? The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah, think on that. Matthew 28, verse 20. What a word of our Savior to his apostles and to his church as he, before he ascends to glory himself. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. That's the New Testament equivalent of our psalm before our very eyes. What is needed then, beloved? In the first place, there is a need of exercising of trust in his second place, the eyes of faith to perceive and to believe and to hold on. Remember that occasion, I'm often struck by it in Second Kings 6, with Elisha and his servant. And when the servant rose up early in the morning, remember that portion well? And uh, he, he rose up early in the morning and, and his, his jaw must have dropped, his heart must have sunk, because he saw on the horizon the formidable enemy, the, the, the armies of the king of Assyria, and he, and he saw the army surrounded. It was the servant and it was Elisha. And he says to his master, he says, what are we going to do? What shall we do? Elisha's response was hard to believe for this man. Elisha says, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elisha, you've lost your mind. You know, there's, there's hundreds, thousands of men with their chariots and their horses and their spears and their swords and their fires. We can't overcome this. As I said, the Lord has rebuked my heart over many incidents leading up to this calling. Now, if we have those worries, if we have those fears, and we say, well, how shall we do? What will we do now? Well, remember, there's something far greater here at stake. There is, there is more with us than with them. And that is understood in the Lord being with his people. The Lord being round about his people forever. So Elisha prays for his servant. And he says, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of that young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And that's the, that's the prayer that we must carry to God over these next few weeks. Lord, open our eyes. Maybe you're not saved. You're not a Christian yet. My earnest prayer is that in the next few weeks, God will open your eyes to see Christ as your only Savior and be saved. A child of God, if you're filled with fears and doubts and worries over whatever I mentioned or other matters in your life, whatever they may be, here's the message for you, that God would open your eyes, increase your faith, enlarge that faith, in the sense that you see that you have all that you have in Christ. That's the idea of the enlarging of our faith. It's not the ability to sort of think to ourselves, you know what, I can dream better things and hope for better things. That's not the increase of faith. The increase of faith is that you understand all that God is, who he is and what he's given in Christ. He's round about you. That's great faith. That's large faith, to see that and to live in the light of that. Eternal God is thy refuge, Christian. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Lastly, God's 
promise cannot be moved. God's promise cannot be moved. Verse 3. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon, he says in verse uh, uh, 3, shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. It might seem almost a verse out of place. Well, how do you understand that verse? Well, it, it comes naturally. The, the meaning really that the psalmist has in mind here is that he is, there is a concern. There is this idea. No, we're being afflicted, we're being persecuted, we're being tried, we're being, we're being pressed down. And the answer comes, no, the Lord is with you and you'll not be moved. And even if the rod of the wicked is upon you, it'll only be for a season and for a time. Let, let's explore these words as we finish. Although the church is built upon an unshakable foundation in Christ, that doesn't mean that it won't be assaulted. And there won't be earthquakes and there won't be tremors. That, that seek to shake its very foundation. We, we know, as I've said before, Job was tested. Satan observed that materially speaking, Job was hedged about. His question was this, doth Job fear God for naught? Well, we can have an understanding Satan's not going to leave the church of Christ alone at any given time, as long as he's still in existence, not cast into the lake of fire. That which is secure will be tested. That which is true will be examined. And weighed. And to a certain degree, the Lord will allow these things to be to purge and to perfect his own people. In verse 3, the promise is this the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous. I try to explain what this means in simple terms here. The thought is this that the rod, this rod of the wicked, this sometimes the rod sometimes can be God's rod. That could be a father chastening. Well, this is the rod of, of sinners. This is the ploys of Satan. This is his means to attack us and to come to us and approach us. And, 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 and the Lord is saying, listen, it will come upon you at times. And it will be your portion on occasions. Whatever it looks like, however it appears or materializes, but it will not rest upon you with permanence so as to destroy you. That's the thought there. And we must not allow those occasions when they do come to be excuses by which we yield to pressure and we give in. No, they don't rest forever. There is an allocation of them. There is a measuring out of this particular lot. It doesn't rest. It doesn't remain. Why? Because the Lord will not allow the righteous who are in Christ to put forth their hands unto permanence in sin. The Lord won't allow that. There's a very heartwarming truth that you've got to understand here. We are to remember that he will allow us to endure certain things, but God will never, never drive his own people to sin. He will give us grace to endure. He will give us strength in every time of need. Our Lord Jesus himself came under the rod of the wicked, but there was no sin found in his mouth. I'm not saying that we would never sin, of course. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying I'm dealing with a, a final you know, damnation, a final end in sin. That's, that's, not, that's never going to happen because we're secure in Christ. We may be troubled, we may be laid low for a time, but it won't rest upon you. The Lord will raise us up again. Our Lord Jesus came under the rod especially, but there was no sin in him. He came under the rod of the justice of God and that he conquered all. And in that conquering light, we live and we serve. With these three things in mind, God's people cannot be moved. God's presence will not be moved. God's promise shall not be moved. For those that we can push on and we can trust in the Lord and we can go on with him in the coming days. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen.